You know, I'd just like to say that I had the opportunity to go down to Washington, D.C. for CPAC, and there was a great audience of, I, I think it was about 300 or 400 people in a room, which surprised me, and I was with Pamela Geller, who was a very, very strong supporter of opposing the mosque, and there were about eight families there, and we did have the opportunity to voice our opinion, and the last thing I did suggest to everyone is your councilmen, your real local, local politicians, start with them. Send them letters. Why aren't they standing up and opposing this? In New York, we have one councilman that has stood up. In New York City, one, a Dan O'Halloran, has stood up and opposed this. At the June 6th rally that I attended that Tim Brown was part of and Andy Sullivan was there, and it was the best, the best rally. They minimalized it and said there was, I think, 500 people there. There were thousands of people there. Thousands. It was wonderful. And one, one councilman spoke, and he was not reelected. Now, if that had anything to do with it, I don't know. But shame on us that Mayor Bloomberg and our local council people are not. So I, after coming back from Washington, D.C., I have been lax myself. I wrote a letter to a councilman that was just elected in Queens, who I happened to meet several times, and if I don't get an answer from him this week, that letter is going into the paper, and it's going to every councilman in New York and assembly person. We have to start, after we leave here, remember and take action. And start with your local politicians. Thank you so much. Who's the Queen Council? Dan Holland. Oh, I know Dan. Oh, my guy? Yeah. Well, you know, he doesn't. No, they don't know. You can tell well, me. Well, his name is. I Jesus. swear I won't tell. I won't. Well, I gave him a chance to respond to me, and he hasn't, so now I will. And I'll let him know tonight that I did give his. his uh, Jimmy Van Bramer, his name is. Van Bramer. Jimmy Van Bramer. I, I want to make a comment about that because it's critical what you just said. Um, we the group that I belong to, we tried to stop a mosque in Tennessee Murfreesboro. Uh, using the, you know, the, the, you know, the way we do things. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we are in this room of sure people of laws, not of uh, men. So we followed the process, and the local people still allowed it to be built. Um, it's, it's critical you put people in office at the local Level. You know, sheriff, city commission, county commission, planning board, uh, appointees that are understand that this is America, this is not Islam. And Islam is incompatible with freedom. Everything. With the Within a state, and it's Islam right. is a state mm -hmm. within a state. And my good friend Tom Trento, who's the executive director of Plus Security Council, went to a uh, to Paris, and there was a, over a thousand activists across Europe, from Russia to England, from uh, Sweden all the way down to Italy, saying, "Enough! You've heard the Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, say." Multiculturalism is a failure. You heard and, uh, uh, David King, <laughs> Prime Minister of England, say the same thing. You heard President Sarkozy in France. Do you realize in France there are over 750 no-go zones? These are Islamic-controlled areas that the police, firefighters, there is no law but Sharia law. And if you allow that to happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you allow that to happen, and it's already happened, as a matter of fact, Can was on the leading edge of this when they, a Jamaat al fulbra exposed the Jamaat al fulbra camp. But you don't see anybody in Congress even talking about that. Why? Why? You don't see, that's the, national security is the first order of business of, the, of any president and any Congress. They're not worried about national security. Yeah. Yeah. 
they're looking in, they're that's looking to get reelected. Yeah, 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 Pete King though. Yeah. So I don't. I, 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 you know, yeah. I want to. One of the interesting things that Tim said. Uh, he said, "You have to look evil in the eye and call it evil." There's a, there's a Lutheran minister named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yes. And he said this: "Silence in the face of evil is itself evil." Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. If you don't know who he is, he was part of the Valkyrie plot right. to kill Adolf Hitler. Right. He was executed on April the 9th, 1945. But he understood that if you don't look evil in the eye and call it for what it is, you are going to be I have two questions. The first one I'd like to address to Andy. Yeah. Um, is it realistic to think that the construction workers in New York City uh, will band together and enough of them will refuse to work so that the building can't actually go under construction, or is that just wishful things? Well, I tell you, when I made the 9-11 hard hat pledge, and I got thousands of people immediately who stood with me, you know, this is after landmarks already designated the building to be destroyed, stood with me right away and said they pledged not to work on that site. I mean, it was one fellow who was out of work months, and they asked him, are you telling me you wouldn't go to this site that's probably a hundred million dollars worth of construction? And he said, I, I would not take, I'd rather pick up bottles than take one bloody check from those people. So, that, that to me, now, you know, on the surface, that sounds great, and you like to think that the whole entire place would band together, but you gotta remember something. This, this assault on America is in itself, it's coming at all different angles. It's eroding our values, our traditions, but they really know where to go to hurt us most, the economy. Okay, so if you gotta feed your family, you gotta feed your family, you know? And I, I just find it, I find it ironic that right now Walmart wants to build in New York. And we have the entire city council and every congressman and senator treating Walmart like it is the menace of the human race. <laughs> But not I sat there for four hours to listen to every useless piece of garbage tell me that the greatest retailer on God's earth, Walmart, is going to hurt the economy. Meanwhile, they want, they're going to, they're welcoming in, opening up the doors, clearing all the red tape, smashing all the hurdles for a mosque at Ground Zero. Yeah. The irony is just too great. I, I can't, I, I can't deal with it. But they can bring in an outside force and build it from the outside because New York is a right to work state. But could you imagine the environment, the toxic environment that would exist? What about the supply of material? I already I have teamsters from around the country who are saying they will not drive a truck that area. Yeah. You heard Andy, right? He has teamsters. <laughs> question, I guess, is, is to the panel, and that is, what is motivating Mayor Hooper? Why, why is he supporting this? He, he, needs, he needs his next job. He just, he's, he ran out of his last, I, I do work for Mayor Bloomberg. I don't want to hog the panel, but I do, I do work for Mayor Bloomberg. He's a very rich man. He gives me a lot of work in my company, but he's going to be out of job a couple of years. He's looking for a, a White House appointment or a possible run at the White House. And, uh, and he has a oh, hold on a second, hold on a second. You get, everybody, you got to realize something. The Islamic community is very small, but the Islamic political lobby is as strong as anything. It is up there with big oil and big pharma. So make no mistake, they might be this big, but thanks to our uh, Achilles' heel, our, me our menace, our political correctness gives them great strength, coupled with a uh, very liberal meaning. And a tax code. Uh, Andy, you want to take 
Okay, first a statement, I guess, and then actually the other gentleman took my question for Andy. Uh, I have to think of a question while I'm off him. For 25 years, I thought the saddest thing I'd ever listened to was taps at my father's funeral. Then on September 10th, I stood I sat and watched on the television and listened to one of those past devices going on, knowing that there was just no way to, uh, that they could be attached to still living people. How could you do that? You have my undying respect forever. Uh, Dr. Smart, I guess my question would go to you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, people who flew the planes training in uh, Sarasota. Did, do you know if any of them had other jobs in this area? I ask this because I used to have debates about uh, terrorism and how it worked and things with a uh, convenience store gentleman named Marwan al Shahi. And I'm trying to figure out whether it was the same person and I failed or whether perhaps he wasn't the same person. Well, let me just say this. Um, if, if I'm very good friends with uh, Lieutenant John Cost, who was the former commander of the uh, Homeland Security uh, Department for the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office, during the <coughs> before and after 9-11, also a member of the FBI Terrorism Task Force 6. Um, he will tell you that the uh, the social, religious, and financial support system that was in place to support Muhammad Atta and his two fellow uh, pilots is as strong or stronger today as it was on September the 10th. Um, we have filmed um, a number of mosques, one in Orlando. Of course, you had your, your, your friendly uh, face here was former professor uh, Sammy Al yes. Yes. who is a self-confessed confessed funder of terrorism. You also have a gentleman in, in Tampa called Ahmed Badir, oh, yeah, a very good looking, attractive, yeah. wears $1,500 suits, um, member of, he was the, uh, he was the media person for CARE National came down to Tampa and was the unofficial spokesperson for uh, Sammy L. Arion. Uh, and now runs a group called United Voices for America that goes every March. Next month, they are going to be meeting and, and gathering in Tallahassee. And they will be going to all of the, the governor and the cabinet and all the, uh, your legislators and Mr. Uh, Mr. Badir is the same snake, just by a different name. Uh, remember, care is Hamas, and Hamas is care. Mr. Badir is totally Sharia compliant. He understands that the way you get something done <coughs> is you elect officials. When, where I live in District 67, uh, the Democrat Party put up a gentleman named C.J. Hafiz to run for the state legislature. That gentleman was luckily defeated by a great guy, uh, now Representative Brad Stubbe, who's an Iraqi veteran. Um, but what was interesting is Mr. Hafiz, his parents are both physicians. They're both from Pakistan. They supported a organization that goes over there supposedly to provide comfort and medical aid to poor villages in Pakistan. That's not a problem. The problem is that group of doctors created a subgroup that is actually funding Pakistani warlords that are trying to get a nuclear <coughs> weapon for our country. That's the kind of people, if you, there is a group that was just two years ago in our nation's capital, for 10 years actually, since 9-11, uh, there is a group called the uh, uh, Muslim Staffers Association, a 
Congressional Staffers Association. Okay? They have Friday prayers in the Capitol. They've been doing it for 10 years. Two years ago, they became officially recognized by the Congress at the behest of uh, the uh, one of two Muslim uh, members of Congress, Keith Ellison. Do you know who the first person after 9-11 in our capital to give the Friday prayer to the Congressional Muslim Staffers Association was? Alawaki. Alawaki. <laughs> Mr. Alawaki. You know who Mr. Alawaki is? Yeah. He is the only American on the kill or capture list of the CIA. Ladies and gentlemen, not only did he give the prayer, there are seven other known terrorists with links to Al-Qaeda who gave Friday prayers in our own capital. Now people ask me, <laughs> where are the moderate Muslims? Why aren't they standing up? Well, wait a minute. If I see I'm a moderate, I want to stand up, and I see an Al-Qaeda operative giving the Friday <laughs> prayers in our capital sanction by our own members of Congress, I'm going to stand up and raise my hand and say, excuse me, that guy's Al-Qaeda. You're out of your mind. So what they do is the mosques have the radicals and they keep them pure. Anybody gets out of line, Yes, I'll wait if you want to applaud for Dr. Sarge. I have to tell you, I lived for eight years in the Muslim world, and I was so glad to find Dr. Richard Squire and his friend Tom Trento in the Florida Security Council. They know what they're talking about. He is our local resource. They are our local resources. If you have a question, that's where to start. Redcounty.com, for starters. I'm happy to give you a commercial anytime. I know, I <laughs> But I want to say to Tim and to Andy, I've seen you both on Fox, and I'm thrilled to be in the same room with you. <laughs> Is there a story there? That's part one of my question. Part two is have you reached out to other survivor families, such as United 93 or the plane that went into the Pentagon? Have they joined your cause? And if not, is that because you just haven't included them, drawn them in, or? <coughs> okay, very good questions. Um, I understand that there was a, some type of field going on with this 11 year olds, that's why they were all 11. Uh, but I've not been able to confirm that. Uh, obviously, we interviewed Pete Hansen. You saw him, very, very heart wrenching story he had to tell about his uh, two year old granddaughter and the uh, call that he got from his son uh, before he flew into the World Trade Center. And when we told him that we wanted to do a montage of uh, Christine at the end of the film, he said, Well, that's fine. And he would give us uh, photos of Christine. Uh, he said uh, he would not agree to it unless we included all the other children that had died on 9-11. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was a great idea. <laughs> we are at the end of the production of the film, as you can probably tell, because you're at the end of it. And we researched uh, who those other children were and uh, uh, put it up there. And, uh, but we never were able to figure out exactly why they were on the plane and in the D.C. And, all. and the second question. Yeah, we have, we have reached out to uh, uh, Deborah Burlingame. Other, there are many other uh, uh, groups representative of the 9/11 family members. Uh, but I, I do want you to understand this. Uh, you know, these films put together to travel to New York are very expensive projects to do. And uh, when we went up there uh, and pulling all the camera equipment around, and you know, John here, he, he eats 
a lot of them, yeah. And, uh, you know what the prices are in New York City, right? So, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we decided we would put a two to three week uh, filming uh, on this, and it became very apparent that all the family members were basically saying the same thing. So we felt we had a great story to tell, and we wanted this story out here fast. We, we didn't want to spend a lot of time, you know, uh, putting it together. So that's uh, why, we, why we have not interviewed it many of the other groups that represent 9-11 families, but it's not because uh, they don't want to talk to us or we don't want to talk to them, we just, we had a budget, we had a schedule, we wanted to keep it, we thought we got the story, and we all saw the story, I think these guys did just a tremendous job, and, and Michael Burke, I tell you, you know, Michael Burke, this is <coughs> we have invited him on some of these trips uh, to Detroit with Andy and Tim, and, and you're all right, you know, these, these guys are on Fox News, you know, they're the privileged that, you know, and other major media outlets the purpose to be able to bring them down uh, for our organization and put them in front of you and not make Cam the story but make these guys the story you know it's, it's, it's remarkable for us and it's, I'm sure it's remarkable for you all to have a chance to uh, introduce yourself to these these heroes I mean, you know Tim has never really told his story I, I know Tim's story here he's always out here but he never tells his story of what he did that day and uh, he is one of the many heroes but uh, he has one of the most shocking, you know, um, heroic stories I've ever heard in, in the entire 9-11 uh, rescue operations. Uh, but uh, there were many heroes that day, and some, uh, you know, they died doing their heroics. So, anyway, there's a little bit the, the, the family members, uh, I, I talk to a lot of family members every day. And on this particular issue, especially on this issue, it's virtually 99% in agreement with, with us. Um, the, 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 what we're doing is difficult. We are traveling and traveling and, and seeing this film over and over and, and meeting more family members. And, and uh, it's, it takes its emotional toll on him. So it, it, it's very difficult, I think, for a family member to, to do this all the time with us. Um, Deborah Berlingame is my brain with this stuff. She, you know, her brother, uh, Chick Berlingame, was a pilot of the plane that went into the Pentagon, uh, Navy, a former Navy pilot. Um, so she, she's pretty good at sitting back home and doing research. She's really smart. So she contributes that way. And then one of my great heroes is David Beamer. And he's, he's come out a few times. Uh, he came up to our rally in New York. I've done stuff down here with him, um, and so he, you know, he's involved with us. So we, we do have representatives from all three places. Uh, we just started last week. We just launched a, a new website called LibertyRocks.org uh, that is going to include all these all these groups. Uh, it's it's a big project that's being supported by a few different people, including uh, ACLJ and Jay Sekulow. Uh, but we're just getting off the ground in there. Write it down and go look at it. You know, we'll keep you up to date on what's going on. And, and the, the other thing about what can we do here in Florida, that Tallahassee thing sounds like a great thing for this group to do. Yeah, yeah. I to the tea parties, you know. We should, well, that's one of the things we haven't done is, well, you guys have, but, you know, we need to be activists. And I'm a government guy, I'm not an activist, but you know what, now I am, because we have to be. Yeah. So, yes. Tallahassee sounds great to me. I don't know what day it is, but hell, I'll come down, and I'll stand in, in Tallahassee. And we'll yes. back up. Now, let me say that, Mark, for the past two years, um, we have we have been there. We actually had David Beamer uh, there, and we had um, several others who speak to um, the issue of, of, and they call it Muslim Capital Day. In other words, it's their capital. Like, it's their capital. And they have a lot of money. It's run by Ahmed Badir, United Voices for America, right out of here, out of Tampa. Uh, and they can rally, and what they do is they, they actually <laughs> put up tents and serve uh, food, and all the staffers come out and just have a good time eating the food. 
of people that want to kill us. Now, it's, it is almost stomach churning to stand there and see this happening. Um, and, and they play the victim card. They play minority card. They play we're an oppressed minority. You know, they, they, they beg for tolerance. But you know what? For them, tolerance is a one-way street. They want our tolerance, but they ain't going to give us their tolerance. They don't tolerate women. They don't tolerate minorities. They don't tolerate people from different religious backgrounds. Do you look at any Islamic country right now? <coughs> one of the sickening things that I see is Wall Journal, New York Times, CNN, Fox News, calling the people in the streets in Cairo and Alexandria somehow wanting democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, they are confusing an election with democracy. Those people do not want democracy. <coughs> they want a more stringent Islamic state. Yeah. Mubarak was putting the lid on the Brotherhood. If the Brotherhood takes over, and my good friend Dr. Mordecai Kedar was in Sarasota, some of the people in the audience were there, <coughs> said that when the elections take place, he expects a clear majority, perhaps 70% of the new government in Egypt in September will be controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. Ladies and gentlemen, that is deadly. What, one of the things that Israel is concerned about, and America should be concerned about, but they seem to be clueless in Washington, D.C., is that Egypt will abrogate its peace treaty with Israel. If that happens, ladies and gentlemen, Katie bar the door. Because all hell is going to break liberally. Hell is going to break loose in the Middle East. The question becomes, what is this president going to do about it? Nothing. He got right where he wanted it already. I'm so glad you brought that up. Because, um, but uh, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I want to say that my husband would be with me here today, but he has a family business in Texas. And when I told him what I was doing, he said, Oh, I thought that was all resolved, that there isn't going to be a mosque. And I think that what you gentlemen in traveling and, and you know, making this effort, and uh, I want to thank uh, Pinellas Patriots for putting this together, because I think that there's this sort of common uh, misunderstanding that this has been resolved and that has been resolved in our favor, and obviously it has not. So this, you, you're giving us an opportunity to bring this to life. The only thing, <coughs> the only thing that's been, I mean, so far, uh, Iman Faisal Raouf, he stepped down. That was the first one. Yeah. Right, he's, he's now, he's not being, he's not the guy at the, uh, at the head. And I know him and Sharif Kamal, he's the developer, are kind of at odds with each other. Now, the second imam that they brought in, who was supposed to be more media-friendly, <laughs> this guy, Adhami, okay, he came in, they started to research him because of the pressure we're applying, and they found out exactly how radical number two is. <laughs> and this guy stepped down because he had to write a book. Uh, so right now, they're searching for number three, which is a good sign, all right? But they're not stopping. They're going to keep coming. And I was telling the people last night, there's no knockout punch. You know what I mean? It's not like, okay, you know what, we stop it here, but it's going to prop up over there. You know, Tim said whack them all. That's exactly, exactly what we're dealing with. It's like taking care of your lawn. You're never going to reach a point where you're done. You're just going to keep at it, or else it's going to overgrow and take your house over. Because if you let nature go, it'll just consume you. And that's exactly what Islam will do to this country if we don't maintain it. Well, I, I, you know, that was my next uh, issue to address. It's not only do we need to stop the ground zero mosque, but we have to stop this stealth jihad. And to your point, sir, uh, right as we speak this very day over in Tampa, Mr. Badir is holding a candidate forum. They are bound and determined to infiltrate our local municipal organization, uh, you know, uh, legislator, 
um, legislature, the legislature and music, municipal positions with their people and to establish pockets of Sharia law. They are on this mission. Right. Um, many of you know that, uh, you know, we, I, I was a supporter of Eddie Adams for Congress. We had a, we had a, um, a headquarters down in South St. Pete. Right next to it was this little convenience meat market. Every day, a man who ran that place pulled in there with bumper stickers of Free Palestine. You know, that's what we have. It's all, it's all around us. And when somebody asks, well, why is Mayor Bloomberg not, you know, do something or recognize the feeling of people, you know, there is, we have to realize that there is a segment in, in America of Jewish American people who want to defeat Israel, who want us to cut loose from Israel. They're the, they're the J Street uh, lobby. That, and this now we have... You know, we are at a very vulnerable time in history of what will happen to Israel. And I don't see the outcry. I don't see the people, you know, Congress making any kind of a, an effort to stand by Israel when we know that they are in such jeopardy. And it all ties into the same thing. I'm not on another bench. It's all about this silent, stealth jihad against America and against uh, the you know, the, the uh, outpost of freedom in the Middle East, which is Israel. Thank you. Wow. Well, let me just say thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> let me just say, we. I, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank the, 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 the key partiers, the 9, 12, 13 state trips. You know, uh, you, you all did a fan. By the way, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Elected some very good people. Um, Alan West. Is a very good friend of mine, very good friend of Tom. He gets it. He's up there. Um, uh, an unknown called Marco Rubio. Uh, and why is it important to support Israel? Whether you like Israel or not like Israel, ladies and gentlemen, if it keeps going the way it is right now, there will be a war in the Middle East. Not because Israel has said so, because the other guys have said there will. I believe them. You have two warships going through right now, the Suez Canal. Two Iranian warships. One of them a submarine that has on it supersonic cruise missile. Why are they doing this? They're preparing for, for the war. And when the Muslim Brotherhood takes over Egypt, the Sinai and the Gaza border and the border with Jordan, with Syria and the border with Saudi Arabia are Katie bar the door. And I will tell you, that if, if Israel is facing, first of all, there are not enough cruise ships in the world to evacuate six million Jews from Israel. They're going to die in place. And I will tell you that the last Israeli will not turn off the lights. They'll push off, push the button and light up the Middle East. That's not what we want. There's a white paper that's being floated around in Israel <coughs> and in Washington, D.C. that I wrote that basically says we need to say, the President of the United States and the Congress need to say, any attack on Israel by any nation will lead to Armageddon for that nation. Not because we love Israel, doesn't matter if you love Israel or hate Israel. Because if you don't do that, you will have a nuclear war in the Middle East. Now, this is sort of a hybrid of what was called MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, during the Cold War. Where I was, by the way, in Germany, <coughs> and we knew I was facing a hundred uh, armored and mechanized Russian divisions and East German divisions, and I knew we were going to get annihilated. But the point was, when they crossed the border and annihilated us, the American people would go crazy, the president would push the button. 
They knew it and we knew it. They never crossed the border. The same must happen in Israel. It needs to be a tripwire like we were in Western Europe during the Cold War. If not, then it's going to be genocide. It's going to be genocide. I, I just want to add something. Something very historic just happened. And me and Tim would have been talking about this since this move, movement began. Now, the Tea Party, which has been an incredible force, has been very stringent in what they concentrate on. And I'm a Tea Party member, too. You know, I got Brooklyn Tea Party, Tea Party 365 out of Manhattan. So I know they like to remain very stringent on that smaller government, tighter fiscal you know, agenda. And I love that. But you know what? We have to break out of that. You know, they've been shying away from the social agenda. That's right. But starting last night, That's right. the Tea Party came out. And when the Tea Party does something, the whole damn nation feels it. Yeah. That's why this thing will work. And you want to know, we need to get to those Tea Party <laughs> groups and leaders and speakers and they need to put this on the agenda because this is it this is the game nothing else matters nothing else matters it's a war against the constitution i don't care if it's in israel i don't care if it's in our backyard in our you know they're electing people everything from dog catcher to the president yes. that's where it starts right it starts at the local level you hear everybody talk about it so please the tea party is going to be key in this mission. Let me just make a brief announcement. This will be the last quick question and Joanna knows I love her, but make it quick. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Squire. Um, we're talking about the local level. You're saying, you're telling us that you live four miles from mosque. Uh, $60,000 was raised by that mosque to send to Hamas. How did that happen? What kind of a contingent of local people belong to that mosque? Is there many? And how and how are Americans being influenced to become is into the Islam Islamic faith? <laughs> well, first of all, um, uh, Islam Islam is 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 designed and built for a 15 to 24 year old with a hormone problem. It is a perfect recruiting tool for someone who wants to dominate women, who wants to beat women, who wants to be a soldier for Allah, who wants to die for something greater than him or herself. That is a perfect scenario. Unlike the Christian and Jewish religions who say, you know, Treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. You know, the Ten Commandments, do not lie, cheat, steal. That doesn't exist in the Quran. There is no golden rule in the Quran. So it's a, it's a perfect, as a matter of fact, one of the recruiting mechanisms, they go into a, a prison, and uh, particularly Jamaat al Fufra goes into a prison, and, uh, and they go to a, a man who's in there for, who's a pedophile. He says, you know what, if you become a, 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 a follower of Muhammad and Islam, uh, you know what, it's okay if you're a pedophile. Because Muhammad married Aisha when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine. And you can do that. You can have several wives. You can have several little girls. And it's okay. That's a powerful recruiting tool. Um, you know, you can steal. Just don't steal from a Muslim. You steal from a Jew, Christian, atheist, a memory. You can kill. You can kill. And not and get away with it. Uh, as, as a Muslim member of the Muslim faith. What we have to do, we have to get the we have to get our members of Congress, our senators in the state of Florida, you know, and, and, and make them aware that national security not domestic policy is their number one responsibility. We're in this mess domestically because they got involved in domestic policy. They spent, and 
and are still spending and will still spend both parties. Both parties. They must focus and we must focus the 2012 election if we want to take back the White House and if we want to take the Senate and keep the House. We must focus on national security, not necessarily all of it for the Tea Party, but certainly if because if we get into discussion with the other guys about domestic policy, they win. Because they're willing to give up anything. They'll continue to print money and give stuff away for free as long as the day is. But if you talk national security, this administration is absolutely clueless, if not dangerous. All right, so I, I just wanted to make that point, and uh, I'll let Tim, because uh, I know you got to clean out the room here. Yeah, we, we got we got planes to get on too, so. Uh, Go ahead.